So Jesus leaves the house and he goes to sit by the lake when a very large crowd gathers around him. Jesus gets into a boat then to tell the first of seven parables. Why does he speak in parables? First, it is Jesus' response to rejection when he's no longer welcome to teach in the synagogue. So in this public setting, Jesus chooses to reach the people of the countryside. And just like parents tell their children stories to teach them simple truths or to warn them against harmful things, even adult listeners could understand and see themselves as actors in the drama of everyday life. The ancient Greek word is parabole, and it refers to settings, things side by side, or taking a present or imagined event and comparing it with a real past event. So from the Hebrew Bible, listen to this taunt song recorded in Isaiah 14, verses three through eight. Take a moment now, close your eyes as I will read it, and imagine this call for social change for Israel under Babylonian rule. On the day the Lord gives you relief from your suffering and turmoil, and from the harsh labor forced upon you, you will take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. How the oppressor has come to an end. How his fury has ended. The Lord has broken the rod of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, which in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury subdued the nations with relentless aggression. All the land are at rest and at peace. They bring into singing even the junipers and the cedars of Lebanon gloat over you and say, now that you have been laid low, no one comes to cut us down. So fast forward several hundred years. How would Jesus reveal the kingdom of God was near under the Roman Empire? Jesus chooses to tell stories that only the humble and the gentle, the poor in spirit, might be ready to hear the truths of faith and obedience to God. Certainly, pride was a barrier for others who had established themselves but lived in their own darkness, of a truth oppressed by their own wickedness. Later, these scribes and Pharisees would pressure Jesus to take back much of what he had taught, that we all are sons and daughters of God, that Christ accepted crucifixion rather than to deny God's will. So these parables, while they reveal God's supernatural activity, they also concealed truth from those who were not interested in hearing. So even as Jesus tells parables to the crowd, explanations were given a bit later only to his disciples. The sower is God. The seed is his word. The roots grow in God's love and in his grace and in his mercy. God's ecology as a master gardener 
included worship, discipleship, spirituality, and mission. However, our hearts can be blind and rocky, rebellious, or faithful. Typically, Palestinian farmers scattered seeds by hand and then plowed them into the ground on family-owned land. And they had two growing seasons, one in the fall and one in the spring. During the time between harvest and planting seasons, some parts of the field were walked upon. So then a path emerged. The seed that fell on this path was exposed and eaten by birds. Other seeds fell on a patch of ground with a thin layer of soil over solid rock, where there's a response to Christ may be only an emotional one instead of a moral one to his teachings. Still other seed fell on the ground where thorny weeds of worry, anxiety, fear, even as disillusionment from exile grew. But finally, a few seeds fell on fertile ground that produced an abundant harvest. That seed is God's word, the path that produced an abundant harvest. So the seed that fell on the path that was rocky is a closed mind or a hardened heart where it is impossible for truth to penetrate due to immorality or a lack of understanding, due to prejudice, which allows Satan to gain a foothold. For other believers, the cost of discipleship was too great. After all, human nature often led many to avoid pain, and still others were enticed away by the world, a business that hindered them from spending time with God. Perhaps now, during pandemic, we see how the world tries to drown us in many ways of distraction, through technology, through the media, through lack of employment, through entertainment, rather than allowing God to restore our lives by his grace and his resurrection. Some seed also falls on good soil and flourishes, whose leaves reflect the green light of the sun, capturing God's heart for a broken world. In rural Zambia, Farmers lop off tree branches, gathering them up to burn and till the ash into the ground before planting the seed. This enriched soil lasts for two or three planting seasons. And indeed, the harvest has always been God's doing since he is the master gardener. A normal harvest is between fourfold and tenfold 15-fold is exceptionally good. But just imagine God blessing the soil to yield a hundred-fold harvest. It's a rich harvest that brings glory to God as the kingdom draws near. When I was growing up in Bayside, Queens, my mom had a wonderful vegetable garden. From a tiny tomato seed, she would have tomatoes that grew up to three pounds. And she planted Chinese string beans, and they would stretch more than two feet long. 
Then she would plant Chinese winter melons. And those melons would grow 25 to 30 pounds. In the early morning, mom would wake up at 5 a.m. and she would be out there weeding and loosening the ground so that the water would reach the roots of her growing plants. And in the afternoon, she might lift the vines of these fuzzy melons. She would lift them high and then she would tie them up with string so the leaves could fully capture those rays of summer sun. In the evenings, she might go out one last time to spread cow manure and to talk to the plants. And then she would spray them also for beetles. So my sisters and my brother, we were a little jealous of that time she spent in her vegetable garden. We would tease her and she, we would say to her that her plants had now also become her beloved children needing that tender and loving care. That's always why there was a rich harvest, to save on grocery bills. So despite all the challenges and dangers of racism that, lived, that, that existed in New York City, we found that sanctuary in our family home, and especially walking in my mom's garden. But as a child, I remember watching the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, of Martin Luther King, and of Robert F. Kennedy. But it was not until I was much older that I learned about America's original sin of slavery of how Protestants, influenced by the teaching of John Calvin, soon distorted his notions of predestination to justify the presence of slavery. And one remembers other unfortunate examples of oppression in US history. The Mexican-American War, the massacre at Wounded Knee, the Chinese Exclusionary Act. If you are ever at Montgomery, Alabama, be sure to visit the Legacy Museum. Because inside is a wall of shelves lined with hundreds of large sealed jars. Every jar is labeled with the name of a lynching victim, as well as the location and date of the lynching. Inside each jar is the soil and possible traces of DNA collected from the confirmed site of the lynching. This area is like a mausoleum where the dead are honored and they are remembered, and yet there is life. Despite what appears to be an absence of sustenance, tiny seedlings have sprouted in some of those jars. These seedlings remind us of people of color who are more than resilient, indeed each one made in the image of God. When Brian Stevenson, an African-American lawyer who defends death row prisoners, looked at these jars, he said, we can grow something with this. We can create something with this that has new meaning. That's because while soil may surround death, it is also a place to plant seeds of hope for a new beginning, 
Amid tragedy and trauma, people of color struggle and thrive. Jesus continues to save, to bring us grace and new life and beauty and justice. Listen to Psalm 126, verses 5 through 6. May those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed of sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, carrying their sheaves. So among the Jewish people in the New Testament, there were many a tzika, righteous, who longed to understand the things that Jesus was saying to the Talmudim, the disciples. There was nothing inherent in Christ's followers that earned them that privileged place of seeing the love of Jesus that was buried deep in that soil of pain and suffering. We read about this pain and suffering in Isaiah 53, verses 1 through 5. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to, to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely, he took our pain and bore our suffering. And yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So then how shall we live? During this pandemic, many of our elders are isolated. The Chinese have been singled out as scapegoats. The Navajo suffer the highest number of COVID-19 cases. Latino families are separated by our lack of compassionate immigration policies. And still, our black sisters and brothers have their blood crying out from the ground. Martin Luther King said, the church can speak out with clarity and with vision, pointing out a path far beyond the law to a kingdom where all sisters and brothers can contribute to society in love and in confidence because God breathed into them the breath of life to live as an heir and a partner of the kingdom of God. There is a need to listen and to learn, but then to lead. We can show sibling love by talking without hurting, being inclusive, removing barriers to opportunity, and being open to what God is already doing. May it always be so among us. Amen.